Okay, with that, I think we'll go ahead and start the session. Um, I suppose I can share my video for a moment so that uh, you can see I'm a real person. <laughs> um, very nice to have you all. Uh, this is a continuation of the, the start of the day where we talked about the WHO packages and that joint effort, uh, University of Oslo working with WHO, Global Fund, Gavi, a number of other partners in creating the individual uh, configuration packages per disease area and uh, health needs. Uh, in this session, we'll cover first, uh, in the first half, a discussion around uh, HIV case surveillance. Um, Dr. Dave Lawrence, uh, who has many years in the field and working uh, from WHO in Geneva at this point, is going to talk through the, the more recent uh, WHO guidance around HIV case surveillance and how that is feeding into the specific package that we've been working on. And then we'll hear some country experiences um, and see a bit of the configuration of that package. So I won't take up more time with my side or introductions, but uh, I'll turn the time over now to Dave to kick us off. Okay, <clears throat> let's see here. All right, I've brought up the presentation. Are you able to see it okay? Yes, yeah, we see it. Great, all right, well, um, first of all, Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, and uh, I wanted to start by thanking the uh, conference organizers. I think this is the third year that I've had the opportunity to present at the DHS2 annual meeting, the first time virtually. Great to be here with you. Oh, my dog has just entered the room. Hold on one sec. Sorry, dog is not leaving the room willingly, so I'm gonna uh, continue. Um, all right, so I'm gonna be presenting today on the WHO HIV case surveillance data use package, which is about addressing implementation gaps using standards-based tools. And um, Enzo and I are gonna do a kind of a one-two on this. Um, this will lead right into the presentation on the, uh, the end user interface. Um, really quick background. Um, some of you have probably seen this before, others may be new to it, but WHO has two HIV strategic information guidelines, one on aggregate data and the other on individual level data. And together, these two guidelines cover what we consider to be the four essential data use cases, starting at the bottom um, with patient care and patient monitoring and all the way up through global. And case surveillance, just so you're clear, is a, a use case that we consider within program management. These are the guidelines. Um, this is the first time WHO put out case surveillance guidelines, believe it or not, in 2017, for HIV at least. And these guidelines together, um, what they try and speak to is the fact that there's, there's something like a core data set, um, both at the patient level and all the way upstream to global level, there's a set of priority data and priority indicators. And, <clears throat> and that concept is well kind of captured in this this phrase, collect once, use many times, which is fundamentally about the health information systems and, and how effective they are um, at achieving efficiency for all the various data end users at country level and, and upstream. I had to include this definition. Um, I'm not even gonna read it, but I wanted it to be in this slide set in case um, there were any questions about it. Be happy to entertain. The piece in red, just to say, it's not something you're gonna find in our guidelines, but it has been used in the UNAIDS uh, Global AIDS Monitoring Survey, um, which we developed with them. Uh, and, and it's the basis for monitoring the implementation of HIV case surveillance globally. Okay, so I think many of you, hopefully all of you are familiar with the WHO standards-based health apps for aggregate data, which include the DHS2-based dashboards. And, <clears throat> This is, the, this is a graphic on the HIV uh, package, again with the centerpiece, which is you know, the DHS2-based dashboards, the, our metadata, which for HIV are, are partial. And then we have the derivative guidelines and the exercises are, as part of that package. So I wanted to speak to this question of why are we doing this for, for HIV case surveillance? So again, um, program management I think for many programs began with thinking about how to make better use of aggregate data, which were more broadly available. And even uh, donor partners like Global Fund and PEPFAR had, fo had focused you know, over the past few years on aggregate data use. 
and and our the package that we put out in 2018 was intended to help facilitate those efforts. But it, but as I think everyone's aware, there's been very broad um, movement towards individual level data systems, and and around program management, which is you know a big focus for us, helping. Um, programs and stakeholders at country level to make better use of routinely available data to Im improve programs, access quality, et cetera. That, that was about case surveillance. So, you know, for the, since we put out the 2017 guidelines, which included this, um, this situation analysis for case surveillance, you know, we've continued to track implementation as we do with other recommendations. And we've been made aware of some real limitations in terms of the uptake of case surveillance. And <clears throat> some of these situation analyses have also given us some insights. And I would say in addition to the situation analyses, just working with partners like the Global Fund through their grants, providing technical support to countries, we've kind of general, uh, generally identified two regions with somewhat distinct use cases, if you will, um, in terms of I would say in this case, tracker specifically. So although that we're talking here about adoption of HIV specific individual level information systems in Afro, and the, on the left side, we see West and Central Africa, um, smaller epidemics, lower investment. And we tend to observe um, less diversity in terms of the software tools that are available in those contexts. Fewer EMRs specifically, and, and certainly fewer that are brought to scale, national scale. And then we have the larger epidemics, higher investment um, contexts, where we see greater diversity of software tools and a lot of, uh, oftentimes, in many countries, EMRs that are brought to national scale. And this has implications for how we've been thinking about trackers specifically. Now, before I come back to that, I just wanted to quickly run through a, a select number of HIV case surveillance um, recommendations and, 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 and highlight some key points. I'm not going to go through all of them. First on the standardization of sentinel events and indicators. One of the things that's critical to bear in mind in case surveillance, which I hope you'll see reflected in the configuration package, is its relative simplicity. Case surveillance is fundamentally a subset of data elements and indicators from what is essentially you know, the patient monitoring universe of data. I heard some interesting discussions in the TB setting about, you know, um, you know, the implications for reworking uh, national M&E frameworks. And it's important that we understand case surveillance is just a subset, if you will. Here's a, here's a snapshot of, um, that's, that's trying to describe some of the evolving case surveillance metadata, specifically looking at Sentinel, these Sentinel events. If you look back at our 2017 guidelines on the left, we defined six Sentinel events. Now, in our 2020 SI guidelines, which are on, again on aggregate data, we, we riffed on that a little bit. And we, even, even though it wasn't necessarily through formal processes, because of the fact that test and treat started just before the 2017 guidelines came up, we really felt compelled to bring in some of the uh, central events around viral suppression, retention, loss of follow-up, and, and also TB preventive therapy, um, which uh, I think you'll see when Enzo presents that. And then um, just, to, just to also say, we're actually starting up the process of revising these guidelines already because it's been very dynamic. And in 2021, we're, gonna, you know, we're essentially going to be reviewing all this and making decisions on, on, on new metadata. Um, OK, so deduplication of records. This is, you know, I hope this is clear to folks, but um, the ability to deduplicate client records at all administrative levels from facility to national is essential. And this is about a robust national, what we're calling a unique identification standard. Now this isn't just a single unique identifier for health or for HIV. This is about identifying all available unique identifiers and or patient identifying information and really characterizing that under a policy, which is then reflected in the, in the digital tools. And, and fundamentally, that is about ensuring that the, the case surveillance functionality is reflected in the, uh, in the tools, in this case, tracker, and that enables us to determine if somebody has been diagnosed in one SNU1, SNU2 facility, and that person moves and is diagnosed again in a different SNU1, different SNU2, different facility, we know that. 
And similarly, if somebody is initiated on treatment and the same thing happens across time and space, we can identify where, where those individuals are. Okay, so this, this last one is just on HIV diagnosis. And I think it's really, it's worth um, highlighting again, uh, you know, because I think there, there have been misconceptions about this. New diagnosis is the, in case reporting is the essence of case surveillance. And it really provides uniquely important epidemiologic information. That's something we've tried to bring out in this, in this package. Okay, and then I guess this is actually the last one on data systems. And I, I just wanted to emphasize a point, which will come up later, which is that case surveillance solutions, like all solutions, are ideally based on the most generic, the most universal data terminology standards. So th that would include things like HL7 Fire, ICD, and a number of other terminology standards. And those are the bases for ensuring robust health information exchange within the, the broader landscape. All right, so, so back to this, um, in, in terms of the, the use cases that we had identified for trackers specifically. So certainly in West Central Africa, um, we were seeing demands for um, development of tracker for HIV. Uh, and, and that gave us the idea that tracker as a primary data capture uh, tool at the, at the point of service or close to it, um, was, was a, a relevant use case or sub-use case, if you will, in that region. And then, and then on the other hand, um, and this was something that was, was uh, an observation that we made at a satellite um, session at ICASA 2019 in, um, in Kigali, that there are a number of these high investment countries with generalized epidemics, many of, several of which have um, achieved high coverage, national coverage of EMRs with various platforms. And they're also looking to tracker as a, as a solution, as the data repository, um, using uh, you know, interoperability layers and help, help data exchange to achieve that. So again, these two distinct use cases for, for tracker for this configuration package that we've developed. The one on the, you know, kind of reflected in this graphic, Enzo is gonna go into more detail, but it's, it's really tracker capture, data capture, uh, you know, primary. And the second, um, and some folks may, may recognize this um, from a, a country in East Central Africa, but this is, this is a situation again where, um, you know, Tracker, Tracker actually in that setting, just to, just to be clear, has currently been configured as a intermediate or interim uh, primary data capture tool for case surveillance, but the long-term view is to use it more as a data repository, which is again, something we've seen in, um, in other countries in the region. Okay, so um, Enzo, how am I doing on time, Mike? Oh, you're doing good. You're good. Doing okay. Yeah, I think All right, can, good. I only got another five or three more minutes. Take um, take as long as you need. Super, thanks. So, one thing I wanted to highlight um, is the fact that later this year we're going to be putting out what what is called the digital accelerator kit, and um, this is something. Some of the components of this are. Um, in, the, in the next few weeks going to be used to inform this configuration package. And the, I'm not going to go into all the detail on that, but fundamentally it's something we've never done before. We've never developed a core data dictionary. Um, we've never uh, essentially done terminology mapping so that all of the various terminology standards which are being applied in various health sectors around the, around the world and certainly in the AFRO region that the business analysts and the programmers and the software development teams, like, like many of you, have that content rendered in, in formats that are much easier to, to use. And it, and it won't matter whether it's DHS2 Tracker or other systems, but it, these are things, these are tools that should be available to you and help facilitate the work that you're doing. Um, just a, a couple quick snapshots of the, the core data dictionary. This is uh, taken from a, another kit. Um, you have the core data dictionary with the data elements and then also mapping to our, um, uh, our indicators. So basically here with the core data elements, you have all of the metadata from our clinical guidelines reflected in our individual level guidelines, which includes case surveillance. And here, all of our recommended aggregate indicators, um, you know, in the updated SI guidelines. So that's gonna be available um, again, ultimately, 
as you see in this slide, in this uh, broader guidelines update, we also um, are looking to develop fully computable and machine readable guidelines content, um, which will include um, uh, fire resources, fire mapping. So, um, so that's, that's on our horizon in the short term, and we hope and expect that's gonna be a, a, a great, great resource for all of you. Um, just quickly, uh, we're working closely with the Oslo team um, to develop, and this is, this is a really exciting area because it's never been done before, even in our primary guidelines, to develop some um, uh, analytic visualizations that really convey the unique utility of case surveillance. So along the top in, in the red circle, you see the five tabs, um, and this is all draft, but we want to we want to show that case surveillance data, like aggregate data, can be very useful at you know providing broad snapshots um, and, and and really get at 90, 90, 90, 95, 95, 95. But in the second tab, you'll see on the demographics, the case reporting, you know, there's unique epidemiologic utility that routine HIV testing data do not provide us, aggregate data do not provide us. And then, then you, you take that further into linkage and retention, some of the, the critical program outcomes, and finally, viral load, clinical and programmatic outcome um, that's, that's the most essential. And then lastly is uh, TPT or tuberculosis preventive treatment, which is um, a, big, a big push right now um, by, uh, by WHO and many partners globally, and it's something we wanted to make sure was, was present here. Um, these are just some very, very draft um, guidelines showing, again, some of the utility. Just, we're talking about basic epidemiology, pers person, place, time, and being able to slice and dice that and really understand more about where new cases are coming from and, and, and hopefully using that information to inform HIV pre prevention programs. Again, just another, um, another uh, screenshot showing similar data in different ways. Down at the bottom, you'll see mode of transmission. This is a key aspect of HIV case reporting um, that you know, allows us to really understand where some of the most at-risk uh, populations are with regards to access and quality of services. Um, and also epidemiologically, again, to understand um, how well our prevention, primary prevention services are doing, um, in particular for key populations. This is just a snapshot. I think this is my last slide. This is actually from uh, the Zimbabwe uh, NACP. Um, this is on track, I believe this is tracker based, and this is um, uh, a, um, a, a data visualization that, that they generated showing some case surveillance data they've been um, developing a, uh, and have implemented a pilot in, on case surveillance over the past months. Um, so nice to see that innovation. And I think that's all I had. Um, thank you for your time and uh, look forward to to end up complementing that with uh, a more detailed look at the end user interface. Over. Great. Thanks a lot, Dave. Um, and just a reminder to everybody, there's a link in the chat to the community of practice where you can post questions. We'll see how much time we actually have at the end of the session to answer them live, but that link will continue anyway in the community of practice where we'll post answers. So please uh, add any questions there. Uh, but then yes, we'll turn over to Enzo now to, to give us a look at the configuration for this package. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you very much, Mike. I shall be sharing my screen now. And I hope that you are able to see it. Uh, yes, uh, like David said, we are still working on this. There's some things that are not finalized about this package, but uh, we are quite on track. Uh, here you can see uh, like the, the list of different patients that are currently being treated. Let me just move uh, my Zoom thing around so I can see what's going on. And then what we're gonna do, we're just going to register a patient right now. Click on register. As you can see already, the organizational unit comes from the, uh, from the organizational unit tree and the enrollment then comes today, which is what we are doing. Uh, so we're going to register a patient, Juan Lopez, uh, we, who was born in the 80s. Uh, current. Um, the, the idea here is that we, we need, like David was talking about trying to deduplicate data, we have different ways of doing it. We have a code for the health facility, like we have the health facility already in which it's being registered. 
Uh, but then we also have the personal information and we have the NHIS ID, which is in this case uh, automatically added and completely unique and the program ID, which is also unique. But of course, it's normal that within each facility, there will be a code that is assigned to patients, maybe if it's been done on paper, so that's there too. And if there is a national ID number, that's also registered. The idea is to have as many unique identifiers as possible. At least four is what we are looking for. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we already start with the HIV case report. And I'm to again move my Zoom interface so I can see what's happening. Try and hide it. There you go. Okay, so we take up the first thing we do is uh, write down the date of the HIV positive test, right? Uh, and let's say this happened last week at some point. And as soon as we do that, it calculates the age when the person was diagnosed with HIV. And we select the probable mode of transmission. Once we do that, we complete the stage and we continue. And as soon as we do it, potential duplicates show up. Uh, this is a different person, so we're going to register it and go ahead. As we can see here, the first thing we see is whether the person is registered in any other program and their profile comes up right on top so that the clinician can always see it or whomever is entering the data. The, mess, the I would say the most important of all the, the, the stages when it comes to data entering is the visit. The visit is a repeatable stage that will happen every time this person gets a visit, whether check his status or get refills on ART. So his first visit date, let's put it just to there. And we marked it, the treatment has started and that today is the date of treatment as initiation. If the person is eligible for tuberculosis preventive therapy, we select it and the fields about TPT show up. It was today that they became eligible and it was today when the treatment initiated and we select from the list of the different tuberculosis preventive therapy regimes available. Okay, when look, then we go to the next section, which is the treatment section, where we first of all select the treatment status, and we get a reminder that viral load fields are only available to patients who have been on ART for six months or more. This person is retained on ART because it's starting the, the treatment, and we select how many treat, days of treatment we are giving them. We give them 30 days then automatically we can see what the last date with ART is and we can complete the stage. As you see, it's a very short stage. It has the bare minimum data elements necessary to, to complete all these sentinel events that, uh, that David was talking about and make sure that we have the data we need. There is no more that is registered. Complete that. Of course, the treatment status determines a lot of things. So we have other status that a person can have. They could be dead, they could have stopped the treatment, they could have transferred out, or they could be lost to follow up. And depending on how they are registered, that would show up on the different indicators and dashboards. We have also included a follow-up stage, which is not linked to the rest of the program through indicators or program rules, but this is a tool for the people managing this person to be able to record any follow-ups that have been done if the person is, uh, is, uh, has been, is, is not showing up through their appointments. So we can register whether or not we've sent an SMS, phone call, home visit, et cetera, and whatever notes about it. This is completely optional stage. And it's there to facilitate that kind of follow-up. I have here a person, a patient, who has been on treatment for several months. Uh, and when we select the latest, we can see uh, and we select the latest, we can see that uh, the fields for uh, their viral testing show up. And this is only available uh, for people who have been on treatment for six months. Uh, and then we select the viral load test date, uh, whether or not their viral load value is less than 1000, which would then mark them as, uh, as a viral suppressed. 
and the same. Uh, and if not, we can enter the test results as a number. All right. We have, of course, the top bar with some, some tips and some reminders about what's going on. For example, if the person has not been on an appointment for a certain amount of time, it will show up here. This person has no, does not have, a, a, has been out of ART for a certain amount of days, for example. And all of this is used to calculate the indicators and dashboards. As David told you, we are still working on these dashboards and we're working on getting a good uh, set of dummy data. Uh, but essentially, we have, yes, these five different sets, uh, just overall case surveillance, demographics, which it takes a bit to load in this demo server, linkage and protection, which mostly focused on the how, whether people have been testing, doing their testing when they should be, viral load, and TPT screening. We focus very much on making this as minimum as possible uh, to ensure that if there's anything missing, you could, it could always be added. If there's anything the country is doing uh, that is useful to them and their workflow, it can always be added and modified. Uh, but but we wanted to keep it as simple and as clean and as minimal as possible to match the current guidelines. Of course, as David said, guidelines are constantly evolving and they're still not finished once for 2021, but when that time comes, we will be publishing and we are expecting to publish this package as soon as possible as well. All right, I think that's all I have to show you uh, without going much into detail into this uh, dashboards, which are not finished. Uh, is there anything else? Mike, are you ready for the next presenter? Do you want yes, me to? Yes, I think that was, that was great timing. Uh, I was just about to warn you. <laughs> so perfect timing. Uh, again, I'm, I, I am starting to see a couple of questions uh, pop up in the community of practice, so that's great. Uh, please post them there. And then at this point, we'll uh, switch over to getting some country perspectives about the use of Tracker in the field. They have not yet had a chance to use this particular HIV case surveillance package because we've been working on it this year, but uh, it will be really interesting to hear what the experience is just rolling out Tracker for HIV individual level data. So we'll start with the uh, Kanema Chianyu that's working with the CIDRS project in Zambia. And uh, I'll turn some time over to you, Kanema. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, let me just share my screen. Uh, hope you guys are able to see my screen. Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, uh, my name is Kalema Chienu, and I'm a strategic information officer at the Center for Infectious Disease Research in Zambia, CIDAS. Yeah, and, and my presentation is about how we are using the DHS to track a capture application for HIV prevention, care and treatment in key population through the Key Population Investment Fund. Yeah, so uh, just an overview of, of CIDAS. Uh, CIDAS was found in in 2001 as a collaboration between the University of Alabama, uh, the Zambian Ministry of uh, Health, as well as uh, the University of Zambia. And it was in initially set up to undertake clinical trials, research in the uh, PMTCT for HIV. And then by 2011, uh, it was incorporated as an independent uh, Zambian organization. Yeah, so uh, much of uh, the bulk of our work is in HIV prevention, care and treatment. And uh, aside as uh, we worked in, in four provinces in the southern part of Zambia, uh, that's implementing both uh, direct service as well as technical support uh, to the Zambian Ministry of Health CDC. 
So uh, as Silas, uh, we have uh, an annual budget of about uh, $45 million. Uh, and uh, we, we currently have uh, 19 active funders with 54 uh, active grants. Uh, we've, we've completed over 80 research studies and uh, we've got 33 which are ongoing as well as uh, in, in preparation. Uh, and uh, we've done uh, some scientific publication of over 100 uh, between 2015 as well as uh, 2019. CIDAS uh, also supports uh, capacity building programs. Uh, we host uh, national and international fellows, as well as uh, health corps. Yeah, so uh, the, the key population investment fund um, is CDC funded, and, and CDC has channeled uh, uh, about two million dollars over a period of uh, two years, and uh, we're expected to significantly involve uh, CSOs in, in the implementation of uh, KPIF. So uh, currently, uh, we are operating in Lusaka province, uh, and we are in three districts: uh, Chilanga, Kafue and Chongwe, and these districts are, are surrounding uh, Lusaka urban district. So there's a significant amount of movement of people between these uh, three districts. And uh, together with Lusaka urban district, uh, we bear like 95% of the people living with HIV for the entire uh, Lusaka province. Uh, and part of uh, uh, the KPIF uh, strategy uh, to be able to, to reach out to, to key populations uh, for HIV testing, as well as improve uh, the linkage to care for, for, those found, um, for those found positive, as well as offering prevention services for the HIV negative. Uh, we've engaged the, the local CSOs uh, and together with them, uh, we've uh, we've provided uh, services to we've provided trainings rather to to the healthcare providers uh, and the trainings have uh, included uh, sensitivity training just uh, to ensure that they they are aware of the the key populations uh, and that facilitates an, an enabling environment uh, for for providing the the HIV care and treatment. Yeah, so uh, just a brief background on the social network strategy. Uh, so the SNS is just uh, one of the strategies that is used to reaching out to uh, to people who are in the same social network. Uh, so to be able to provide uh, HIV testing and counseling services. So uh, SNS works on the underlying assumption that people in the same social networks, uh, they share similar risk. Uh, phase. So first you, you recruit uh, people that will be like initial seeders uh, and, and they are able to link you to other people in their network. So once you identify them, you engage them and they link you to, uh, to the people in their network. So once you offer services to, to the people in their network, uh, you try as well to recruit them so that they can give you um, more people who can become recruiters as well. So uh, it's, a, uh, it's a continuation thing, uh, as in the, the recruiters can also become recruiters uh, at some point. Yeah, so um, currently uh, we've been able to, to reach out to a number of uh, key populations. Uh, so mainly uh, the challenge uh, with the uh, national EMR system uh, is that it's got legal issues uh, concerning the, the the key populations, and it doesn't explicitly uh, identify this type of population. So you find that uh, when offering uh, uh, HIV care and treatment services, 
it's very difficult to to identify them uh, from the from the EMR system. So retention to care and treatment has been a challenge because they are they are mixed uh, with the general population in the EMR system. So if you want to target uh, viral load sample collection as well as resulting, it's also a challenge. So uh, we decided to uh, to develop uh, a tracker capture application, uh, which uh, will be able to track these clients uh, separately uh, from the from the isolated hubs where we we provide these services. So uh, once we reach out to them. Uh, <laughs> So uh, uh, once once we reach out to them and uh, have their data, <laughs> once we reach out to them and have their data in DHIS2, uh, this data is also entered in the EMR and uh, using identification information such as ART numbers, we are able to uh, to link the client data between. Uh, the DHS to track our application as, the, as well as the EMR. And uh, we're able to track these clients. Uh, we can get the, 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 the viral load. We can track clients who are due for viral load. Uh, we can track clients who are, who are supposed to be linked to care and treatment, as well as uh, uh, tracking the recruitment links uh, between the, the initial recruiters and the recruitees. So uh, just a brief dive in uh, in how the tracker program looks like and how and how it works. So uh, on the initial profile, uh, we are able to uh, generate a unique UIC. Uh, this UIC is uh, 19 characters and it's automatically generated from uh, from a combination of characters that are gotten from the question. So. Uh, you see that we're able to get the the two letters from the province as well as the first two letters from the first name and uh, the mother's name. You were able to get the the code for the sex as well as the code for the birth order and uh, the last two digits of the year when this client was born, as well as the month when the client was born. And then uh, apart from that, uh, uh, we get the uh, the unique number from the coupons that uh, are used to track the client's uh, recruiter. So each client who's recruited is given a coupon, and then the coupon, uh, there's the number of the of the recruiter, and that one is captured as well. And uh, once we have the recruitment links, uh, we're able to import those links into responder-driven sampling software, uh, which uh, helps us to build the, the recruitment trees. Yeah, so uh, just looking at uh, some of the uh, program stages uh, for the HIV uh, cascade. Uh, so you see we've got the, the key population screening, which has got a, a couple of questions about the risk factors that uh, these clients are exposed to. And depending on how they answer those questions, uh, the, the, the tracker program is able to, class, to automatically classify whether this person is a, Sex worker or is a period, and then uh, we uh, clean peripheral. If this client is tested positive, uh, they are initiated on art, and then uh, we capture the ART number. So this ART number is what enables us to link uh, the clients between the two systems, and then from that uh, we're able to get the viral load data as well as the the pharmacy refill data through DHIS2 tracker program. Uh, so just a, uh, uh, a brief look at the, some of the statistics that we currently have uh, from the time the program was implemented in October 2019 uh, up to somewhere around July. So we see that we put a high positivity yield in the female sex workers and uh, a low positivity yield in the, uh, in the transgender. 
and the linkage uh, seems to be uh, at least above 95 percent for for all the key population types. Then uh, on the viral load cascade, uh, we seem to still be having a challenge challenges in in our coverage uh, because you know uh, these people are, are mobile and uh, are tracking them sometimes is a challenge, but currently in the field, we are still trying to call them uh, so that everyone who's eligible, we are able to reach out to them and be able to uh, to get uh, the views from them. Yeah, but uh, our suppression rate, uh, like for Chongwe, you see that everyone who had the view uh, done had uh, had a suppressed viral load, but for for Kafue, uh, it's still a bit low. Uh, Chilanga only started implementation somewhere in April, and as of now, we don't have any client who's uh, like eligible uh, for viral load. Uh, so, can, so, I, can so, I just give you a, it's a, a two minute warning here? Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm almost concluding. Yeah. So, some of the challenges are this one then are that uh, there's no API link between the two systems, so the matching of client data between these two systems to uh, a bit manual. And uh, as we are doing uh, this matching to ensure that the format as well as the as, uh, we won't be able to, to match the clients. So uh, the tracker captures is the identification of KPs as well as uh, tracking of uh, client recruitment processes. And it has also improved uh, the retention to care treatment as well as viral load monitoring. So a special thanks or an acknowledgement to PEPFAR, CDC, uh, National AIDS Council, Ministry of Health, uh, KP Civil Societies Organization, as well as the KP participants. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, very interesting, and it's it's nice to see that it's working. Um, would be interested to see about creating more of a, an automated link with the the other system. Um, for now, we'll we'll turn to our last speaker, which is uh, Kwame, coming to us from uh, Ghana Health Services in the PPME unit that's responsible for DHS2. And in Ghana, they've been using uh, Tracker for HIV now for. Uh, a couple of years, it seems like. Um, but we from the University of Oslo have also kind of directly been involved in the implementation in recent year, uh, trying to make sure that uh, everything can work with the kinds of analytics they produce, et cetera. So very interested to hear more. Uh, Kwame, are you able to unmute and share your screen? Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I guess. Great. We're seeing your screen and we can hear you. Great. Um, so, uh, my name is Kwame with the Ghana Health Services. Just going to um, give you a quick overview on what we are doing in Ghana as far as the HIV tracker is concerned. So this is just a, a brief background that we've been doing using DHIS from 2011. And then we actively started using the tracker for HIV in 2019. The process began in 2017 through to 2018, but then actively we started using the HIV um, tracker in 2019. Um, we've, we have other implementations. Um, so this is just um, some background to how we um, arrived at using the HIV tracker. So when you follow through, we actually had a standalone system, um, which we use, we've been using over the years, but then um, after um, some assessments, um, it was recommended that we migrate onto the tracker. So we started the process in 2019, and currently we've been able to widely deploy 
the tracker. So these were these are the objectives. I mean, why we decided to migrate onto the tracker. So first of all, to ensure that all our ART clients level data for generation of key indicators are accurate, reliable, and easily accessible by partners. Well, um, we the challenge with the standalone system was it's the data or information was not visible enough to key stakeholders. So it made it difficult for easy access to data for decision making. Then also to ensure that sites are able to collect, manage, and analyze store client-based records, which is key. And then track clients over time using flexible set of identifiers, track missed appointments and generate business schedules. And then um, the, one of the very important things is managers and other users being able to generate all required reports using the various reporting models within the, the teams. We have a, a national repository which still writes on the um, DHIS platform, only we have a different name, we call it the teams. Okay. So what is the scope? We've successfully implemented in all 16 regions across the country, in all ART sites, and, and the tracker is currently used for client management, and then it's also used to schedule appointments and also track missed appointments. We are also able to generate service reports and other key indicators. For example, they are currently on treatment, which is key management. We are also able to generate summary reports, which are automated into the teams, which is a national repository to make um, data available at all levels. And then we are also in the process of rolling out the testing model. Currently what we work with is for the management of clients who are already positive. So we are now looking at um, deploying, modifying and deploying um, a model to capture the testing as well. So we can now follow the client to right from testing all the way to um, treatment. Now, um, in, in using, in configuring the tracker, we um, look at these broad areas, um, design, configuration, hosting and security, real time versus secondary, the scale, training, IT support, Android versus web, and then interoperability with existing HMIs. Um, fortunately for us, we have over the years um, built a local team to provide support for all our DHIS2 instances. So the same team was tasked to manage the tracker as well. Um, our deployment is currently using both the web and then the Android. Um, of course, in areas where connectivity is a challenge, we use the Android and then where connectivity is quite okay, we use the web. So what are some of the challenges? So the main challenge, of course, is the acquisition of electronic devices for a full-scale nationwide deployment. Um, these um, devices really come at a very huge cost. And most often, uh, in our case, we did not get the government to provide the support, so we had to fall on partners to support in the procurement of these devices. And then also, um, another challenge is funding for training, because of course, this means that you need to take this application to all ART sites across the country, train the service providers to be able to use the system for its intended purpose, which is of course to um, register and then manage clients. And then also change management. Um, in introducing any new system, of course, you need to you go through a lot of trouble trying to get people to buy into the, the new system. So um, that also was a bit of a challenge, um, but thankfully um, over the period, we've been able to get everybody on board. Now, the stability of the tracker app for offline data capture. Um, we've been trying several versions of the, uh, the Android app, and initially we were having some challenges with um, some of the versions, but again, 
once we we reported to the Oslo team and they, they provided us some support. So currently uh, we have a fairly stable app um, for the tracker. Now we also have um, another challenge, which is actually abuse of devices by end users, including installation of unauthorized apps. Um, we initially um, got a mobile device management um, application, but then again, it also comes with a, a cost because then you pay a certain amount per device for a month. Um, we were we had some support, but um, once the support ended, we are struggling to get um, support for the device management services. So we are still working around to see how we can get support for, for that. Currently, we are operating without the device management services. Now, overcoming these challenges, we, we believe in continuous engagement with all stakeholders for support. And then we also believe in progressive deployment instead of a one-time deployment. Um, what this means is that if we want to wait to get enough resources to roll out um, across the country, yeah, we might never have that opportunity. So what we do is we progressively deploy we start from a point, and then as and when we get some more resources, we scale up. And then also one very key thing is we, right from the beginning, try to meet the needs of most stakeholders, especially in the areas of um, generating service reports and indicators of interest. Because um, once people enter data, the next thing they will ask for is to get their reports, their summary reports. So if the reports are missing, it becomes um, a bit of a problem for the service providers because then they will have to do entries into the tracker and then also do manual collation. So to eliminate that problem, we try as much as possible to generate all the required reports so that it will serve as motivation to get our care providers to actually use the system. And then we are still um, working with the Oslo team to get a very stable version of the Android app to support our offline data capture. So these are some of the pictures, um, deployment in pictures. This is all I have for now. Over. Great. Thank you so much, Kwame. Uh, and yes, it's uh, you uh, in, in Ghana were early adopters of the Android app as it was released, and the whole platform has benefited from some of the pains that you went through with the stability of that new app because we identified a number of things that could be fixed and improved. So it was uh, really great to be able to collaborate on that. So we, we don't have a lot of time left uh, for questions, but uh, there were a couple of them that were put into the community of practice at that link. You can see Enzo has already responded to those that have been posted. Maybe one of them that I wanted to address, there was a question about when the WHO uh, configuration package would be available. Um, do you, uh, Enzo, Dave, do you want to take a swing at that about when that would be available? I can, well, I can, uh, go ahead, Enzo. I, I was just going to say that we are working really hard to get it uh, finalized as soon as possible, and then it's just a matter of uh, doing some testing. But yeah, I'd rather hear what you have to say there. <laughs> yeah, no, um, we, yeah, we've, we've had one country virtual uh, consultation or validation and we have another one set up next week um, I think we've still got the uh, you know finalization of the dummy data in the dashboards I think that's probably the biggest lift and um, you know I think we will probably have a solid beta version within the next month and our our timeline is definitely to have this disseminated um, certainly from the WHO side and and certainly through Oslo networks um, by the end of the year. Um, hopefully that means more like November instead of later, but yeah, that's my best, best guess at this point. 
Yeah, great. And we've been uh, going through some consultations with a couple of different countries uh, as we've been putting the package together, getting experience from uh, Rwanda and Botswana and, and trying to make sure that what is in that package is useful and available, hopefully making it easier than the steps that uh, Ciders and uh, Ghana had to go through to set up their own. I think one key thing that is a really good principle behind this uh, configuration package is the simplicity of it. Um, that there's a very strong focus on collecting just the necessary data to produce the, the indicators for case surveillance. This is one of those challenges that we always see with the individual level data collection systems that as soon as it's possible to collect data, then everybody wants to collect everything, um, which uh, quickly becomes a burden and a challenge for the, the poor people at the lowest level trying to do the data collection. So uh, we, we hope that this configuration package will really help to drive kind of the, the push to collect only the essential data for for, for these programs. So with that, um, we'll have to wrap up this session. Uh, very grateful to uh, Dave, Enzo, Kanema, uh, Kwame for their, for their presentations and for sharing this work with us. Um, we will make uh, the slides from this session all available on the conference website. And again, there are uh, answers already to questions in the community of practice, but feel free to continue to post there and we will be monitoring that thread into the future. So thank you very much, everybody, for your participation and uh, good luck with the rest of the conference. There is the uh, several expert lounge sessions that are starting now at four o'clock. Uh, so take a look to see if any of those would be helpful to you. Uh, there will be one in particular on Tracker that I would promote uh, focused on program rules. Um, so those of you that are struggling with some of the more complicated kinds of Tracker program rules, please take a look at that session. So thanks again, everybody.